Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship today on the 31st of January 2021. Hard to believe it's the last day in January, but hey, we are one week closer to being out of this. I have just one announcement today, and that is to remind you that this afternoon, if you wish, we are having a drive through offering like we did last year. The times have remained the same for most side members. It will be between 12 and 1 in the church car park. And in Toberdoni, it will be between 2 and 3 in the afternoon. There will be someone there to collect your envelopes, should you wish to contribute to the Lord's work this afternoon. There's no pressure to do this, like I said before. But if you would like to, we will facilitate that for you this afternoon. Our call to worship is from Matthew 28, well-known verses also known as the Great Commission. It says this, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's worship the Lord as we pray together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are truth. Your word is truth. Your spirit is truth. And we are to worship you in spirit and in truth. But we live in a world of lies where people deceive each other and twist the truth to suit their own ends. And we confess that we often get caught up in that as well. Forgive us, we pray, for our own lies and deception. Forgive us for taking the truth and twisting it to our own end. Forgive us for being like the world. Help us to be aware of our own lies. May we be aware of the lies that we tell ourselves. May we be aware of the lies we tell others. May we be aware of a living a life that is a lie unto you. Once again, forgive us and help us to walk in the truth. Bring us this morning to your real awareness of ourselves and move in us, we pray. Convict us of where we need you to come and bring your truth. Father, we are waiting for you this morning to speak to us and to show us your ways. And may we follow those ways. Give us the courage to follow you and make whatever changes we need to make in our lives so that we grow deeper and deeper in love with you. And give us the courage to be your disciples, to be your ambassadors in the world in which we live. Give us the strength and the willingness to reach out to a hurting world and tell them the good news that Jesus Christ can bring them life and life to the full. Father, we know that you care for us because your word tells us that you care for us. From beginning to end, your word is a grand story of your care. It shows us through every page that you love your people and you care for them. And we thank you, therefore, that you do care for us. Even when at times we don't feel it, you do care. Father, as you know, some of us are weak and weary. Some of us are tired and burnt out. Some of us are stressed and uptight. Would you pour your spirit on us and release us from this? Would you break the chains of stress and worry? Would you smash the fetters of tiredness and weariness? Would you untie the ropes of fear and release us into a deeper kind of life with you? A life in your care. We are reminded of the truth in your word that the eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. What an image of protection and care. What an image of your love for us. Father, may we feel those arms underneath us, holding us, protecting us, even embracing us like a good father would. What an awesome God you are. So help us in our weaknesses and in our frailty. Help us in our times of need and be to us everything that you have promised to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. And it says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. 
Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Rather, go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And we end it there at verse 16, knowing, of course, the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Boys and girls, welcome to Sunday, the last day of January. How has the month been? Has it been rough for you? Has it been good for you? Have you been enjoying homeschool? How good is your mummy or daddy at being a teacher? I'm going to give them a wee look over at them and think, hmm, you're great. Tell your mummy and daddy you're great. Go on, tell them now, right now, or your granny or granda or whoever you're with there. Turn around and tell them you are great. And boys and girls, you know what? You're great too. And Jesus loves you and he cares for you. And we will get through this. Now, I have something to say about courage. The other day, I decided to go for a wee swim in the sea. But I forgot to bring my wetsuit. And I thought to myself, do I go in my shorts? Or do I, do I just not go at all? And I, I needed a wee bit of courage to go into the sea. Have a look at this and see what happens. Boys and girls, today I'm here at Dunseverick Harbour for my daily exercise. But instead of going for a walk, I thought I'd go for a wee swim in the sea. So, uh, here we go. I'm going to go for a wee swim in the sea. I forgot my wetsuit, but sure. I'm okay in my t-shirt and short shirt. It's only January. There was only snow yesterday. Sure, it doesn't matter. You know what, boys and girls? Looks a wee bit messy and dirty. Loads of seaweed. And it might be a wee bit cold. Ooh, I don't know if I can do this. No, I can't, I can't do it. I can do it. I'm gonna do it. I don't know if I can do this. No, I can. I can do it. I can do it. Boys and girls, you cheer me on and say, go Andre, go Andre, go Andre. Yes, I can do it. Watch, I'm gonna go first. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. I can do it. I can do it. Oh no, I can't. I can't do it. Oh, it's too cold. Oh, oh, it's too cold. I can't. I can't. I can't. Boys and girls, did you see that? I. I needed courage and it took me a long time to go into the sea. I had to build up the courage and go, and uh, it wasn't very easy for me to do. And when I was in the sea, I was cold and it didn't, I didn't last very long because I didn't have the courage I needed. Boys and girls, this is the way things go. Sometimes we're scared to do things and we need courage to do it. And you know what, boys and girls, even when it comes to living for Jesus, it can be hard. 
when people are doing things that Jesus tells us not to do, it can be hard not to join in. It can be hard to take a stand and say, I'm not going to do that because that's not right. It can be hard to even tell the people about Jesus. Boys and girls, we need courage to do that. And this is the great news that Jesus gives us courage. Jesus says, I am with you always. And the Bible tells us that when we believe in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit in us that gives us the courage that we need to make a stand for Jesus and to tell other people about him. So boys and girls, you don't have to be afraid of anything. You don't have to be afraid of telling others about Jesus or making a stand for Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of anything because Jesus is with you. And his Holy Spirit is in you if you've put your trust in Christ. If you haven't, why not do that now? Why not say to Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Would you come into my heart and be my saviour and give me all the courage that I need? Wouldn't that be awesome if you did that? Why don't you do it now? Boys and girls, with Jesus in us, Jesus beside us, we don't have to be afraid. We have all the courage that we need. So boys and girls, if you're ever afraid or scared or anything, Pray to Jesus. Pray that he will give you courage in whatever it is you need. And he'll do that. That's all I have to say. I hope you have a good week and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Last week we looked at how God has placed us in certain situations or places that are unique to us. And these are the places that we can bring the presence of Jesus and flavour those places for him as we are salt and light. But I left it last week acknowledging the elephant in the room. The fact that bringing the presence of Jesus to wherever we go is scary. And we need courage to do this. So for a moment, sit back and listen to two examples of courage taken from the Mental Floss website on incredible acts of courage. The first is Desmond Doss. Doss's religion forbade him from carrying a gun or threatening another human life, which was very inconvenient when he was drafted into the Second World War. So Doss was a conscientious objector, someone who objects to violence, placed as a non-combatant and was the target of ridicule from the other soldiers. He was serving as a field medic in Okinawa when the Japanese attacked his unit on top of a cliff, cutting down nearly every man. Doss quickly rigged up a stretcher that could be lowered by a series of ropes and pulleys to the ground below, and then by himself under heavy fire, he retrieved each soldier in his unit one at a time and lowered them to safety. A film was made about his heroic endeavours starring Andrew Garfield called Hacksaw Ridge. The next person is Irina Sendler. When the Nazis invaded her native Poland and rounded up all the Jews into a walled ghetto, Sendler knew what was going to happen. She was a social worker and got credentials as a nurse so that she could sneak food and medicine into the ghetto. But what she snuck out was even more phenomenal. It is estimated that Sandler and her group helped get approximately 2,500 children out of the ghetto, sedated and placed in the bottom of toolboxes or lying in burlap sacks at the bottom of her truck, and she sent them through a network of like-minded comrades to Christian orphanages, where they were given new identities. She kept their real names in a jar, buried in her backyard. Sandler was eventually caught by the Nazis, who imprisoned and tortured her, breaking both of her legs. When the war ended, she devoted herself to reuniting the children with her families, though it proved nearly impossible to do so. These are two examples of real-life acts of courage. But you've got to ask yourself, why on earth would someone do these acts of courage and bravery? What possesses someone to go to such lengths? For example, Irina Sandler, what possesses her to put themselves in such danger for the sake of people they don't even know? Now, I'm sure there are many answers to this, and I can't speak for Desmond Doss or Irina Sandler. But one thing that stands out for me is this. These people faced the danger and even death because they believed in something bigger than themselves. 
They believed in something bigger than the danger they faced. They were prepared to face the torture, the ridicule, the imprisonment, because they believed that saving the lives of children or saving the lives of soldiers was more important than their own comfort. Saving the lives of people is or should be more important than our own comfort. Let's imagine for a second that we have a modern day Noah's Ark happening in North Antrim. Imagine for a minute that God speaks to you, directly to you, like you hear a real audible voice from God. And he says he's going to destroy the world again by a flood. Okay, I know the rainbow is the promise that God won't flood the world again. So let's say God says he's going to destroy the world with a fire. He's going to burn the place up, except for the churches in the country. Anyone who is physically inside a church will be saved, physically inside the building. And God tells this to you. And it's going to happen in three days' time. Now, what would you do? Would you run to the nearest church and stay there for three days until this happens? Would you spend those three days getting your family and friends into the church? Would you spend those three days getting everyone you know into the church? Or would you spread the word that God is sending fire on the earth, but if anyone is in a church, they'll be safe from the fire? Would you take those three days to run around and tell people, warning them that fire is coming and unless they're in a church, they're going to be burned up? Or would you just run into a church yourself, save yourself, maybe your immediate family, and forget about bringing anyone else with you? I think most people would at least tell their friends and family but would you tell other people too? Would you tell people you, you don't know? You have three days to save as many people as you want. What would you do? What about those people who don't believe you and ridicule you about this? I mean, God's told you, but if you run around the streets of Coleraine and tell them this, chances are people are going to laugh at you. What do you do about them? Did that put you off? Would you even care if you could get some people into a church to be safe? Would you be like Desmond Doss or Irina Sandler and face the danger and the ridicule in order to, to save people's lives? Of course, that sounds a bit far-fetched. Independence Day kind of stuff, end of the world kind of stuff. Truth is, what I've described is not far from the truth. I mean, it's true, God will never flood the world again. The rainbow promises us that. But God will destroy the world with fire. It says it in 2 Peter 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. And the ungodly are those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. They are those people who have not trusted in him for the forgiveness of their sins. They are the ones who will be destroyed in fire. And we have the good news that those who trust in Jesus Christ, who have their sins forgiven, will escape this judgment of fire and will stay, instead live in paradise. That's the good news that we preach. And it's all thanks to the sacrifice that Jesus made when he died on the cross to make it possible. But not only do we have this good news, we are asked to pass it on to those who do not believe so that they too can escape this judgment. So my imaginary story wasn't that far off. The difference is that being in a church building doesn't save us. Being part of the church, the community of believers through our faith in Jesus Christ, that is what saves us. And Peter says, just after this verse, that Jesus will return like a thief in the night. In other words, at any time. When we're not expecting it, he could come at any time. And it's those who are found trusting in Christ that will be saved. The rest get destroyed in an eternal fiery judgment. So it's not that far from the story I said earlier on. Question is, 
do we have the same bravery and courage that Desmond Doss and Irina Sandler had? Do we believe that saving the lives of men, women and children is more important than our own comfort? Jesus said in our passage today that he is sending us out as sheep among wolves. And if that's the case, how can we actually and practically go into the world as sheep among wolves? Because let's face it, that is scary. And it takes a level of courage that most of us don't have. Well, thankfully, we can take some comfort and strength from our passage today. In today's passage, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And their quest, their mission is to proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And I love those words at the end. Jesus says, I'm giving you all this stuff for free. Go and give it away to someone else. It's pretty impressive stuff right there. Raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons. But as disciples of Jesus who follow his commands, we are to do the same thing. But you might think to yourself, well, hang on a second there. These are Jesus' disciples. I mean, these are his right-hand men. These are the original 12. Of course, they're going to be able to do this amazing stuff. They are the original disciples and only the apostles did this. No one else did this kind of stuff. Okay, well, think about the disciples. Were they they special? Were they a, a special bunch of people? There was a list of the disciples there in that passage. Do you remember some of the names? There was a tax collector, a few fishermen, a zealot, a thief. These weren't special people. They were ordinary people, but they had a special friend. Let me repeat that. The disciples were ordinary people with a special friend. But I hear what you're saying. They were the 12 disciples, so they were pretty special in some way, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Then what do we make of Luke chapter 10? When it says this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Now, we've got a problem here. These people who did all these amazing things weren't just the 12 disciples. These were 72 other people who Jesus sends out and also gives them the power and authority to do stuff that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. Hmm. And then in Matthew 28, Jesus sends his disciples out saying this, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And this is kind of like one of the verses we go to when we think about mission. Jesus tells his disciples to go. Go and make more disciples, which is what we are. We are the more disciples. But since we are more disciples, our command from Jesus is to go and make more disciples. So we are commanded by Jesus himself, whom we follow, To spread the good news that Jesus offers salvation from this fiery judgment that is coming. But like my scenario earlier, we are to go and tell people that if they trust in Christ, they will be saved from this. That Jesus can save people from their sins and give them eternal life. But here's the thing that we might miss. Jesus gives us the same power and authority that he gave the 12 disciples. And the same power and authority that he gave the 72 others. Power to heal the sick. Power to raise the dead even. Because there's more than one way to be sick. And there's more than one way to be dead. You see, we can be physically sick, but we can be spiritually sick. We can be physically dead, but we can also be spiritually dead. And Jesus gives us, his disciples, the power to heal the sick and raise the dead. Because there are people all around us who are spiritually sick. Who think that they're right with God because they come to church. Or maybe they don't even come to church, but they think they're a decent person who doesn't done, hasn't done any harm. In fact, these aren't spiritually sick. These two people are spiritually dead, some of them. Dead in their sins, as Paul says. And they're going to be judged for their sin 
unless they ask Jesus for their forgiveness. Don't forget, Jesus only pays the price for the sin of those who trust in him. Everyone else has to pay the price themselves. And so many people are facing this fiery judgment. And so many people think that they're not going to because they think they're a decent person. But they haven't actually trusted Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. They're doing it on their own efforts. And then there's people who are spiritually dead. Who don't believe in God. Don't believe in Jesus. It's all just nonsense. And they have no interest in him whatsoever. These people are also facing fiery judgment. And they will miss out on eternal life if nobody tells them that there's life to be found in Jesus Christ. So there are spiritually sick people and spiritually dead people out there all around us. But Jesus has given us his authority over the sick and the dead. And this is where we come in, you see. We are all commissioned by Jesus to go out into the world and proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand and is found in Jesus Christ. But while this takes immense courage, look at the last verse of Matthew. Jesus says, surely I am with you always. Now, we often take this verse out of context and use it to remind ourselves that we're not alone in this life, that Jesus is always with us. Now, that is true. But in the context of this passage, Jesus is saying that he has given us his authority, authority from God himself, authority over sickness, authority over death, authority over life. And that while we go as sheep among wolves, he will be with us us. This verse is not a general I am with you verse. This is a specific promise that as we step out into the world for Jesus as sheep among wolves while it takes immense courage we are not on our own because Jesus is with us through his Holy Spirit and he gives us the authority the ability and the courage to tell others about Jesus. And when we do this That's when we'll see the power of God manifested in us. That's when we'll see the sick being healed and the dead being raised because there's more than one way to be sick and there's more than one way to be dead. But so often we don't see any of this. And I think one of the reasons why we don't see any of it is because we're not engaging the world for Christ. So many times we don't see any power of God because we're not doing anything that requires the power of God. And so we're not relying on the power of God. Going about your daily business doesn't require the power of God to that extent. The power of God is manifested, is made visible when we go out into the world and heal the sick and raise the dead. If we stay in our churches or our homes and never go out and spread the gospel, then we won't see any of this power in action. But it's hard. It takes courage. And as I was preparing this sermon, the question that I asked earlier burned in me. Do I believe that saving the lives of men, women and children is more important than my own comfort. And I do believe that it is more important. But I'm scared to do this because Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. We're going out as sheep among wolves. That's not all sweetness and fairies. It's brutal. But I've got to remember that this is a command from Jesus for me to do. But I've also got to remember that Jesus will be with me through it all giving me the power to do it, his authority, and he'll be with me. All authority has been given to Jesus who will be with me as I do it. So I have the power in me to heal the sick and raise the dead through Jesus' spirit. Because don't forget, there's more than one way to be sick and there is more than one way to be dead. We can be spiritually sick and we can be spiritually dead. Jesus took ordinary men and did extraordinary things with them. Jesus took ordinary bread and fish and fed 5,000 people with them. There was nothing special in the bread. There was nothing special in the fish. There was nothing special in the disciples. There's nothing special in you and me. The common denominator in all of this is the power of Jesus Christ. And that same power is available to us as we go and make more disciples. Jesus can take the ordinary things and do the extraordinary with them. But oftentimes we only see the extraordinary when we step out in faith and courage. Apart from this, the disciples didn't really do anything that was terribly extraordinary. Okay, Peter walked in water, but who was with him? Jesus. Okay, in Acts, they spoke in tongues, they healed the sick, they even raised the dead as well. But who was with him when they did it? The Holy Spirit. 
You see, they did these miraculous, amazing, spectacular things when they stepped out in faith and courage. And I firmly believe that when we step out in faith and courage, we will see spectacular things happen. But the disciples could only do it because God was with them. And we can do this too. But we can only do it because Jesus is with us. Like he said at the very end of Matthew, I am with you always. Now, Sometimes people who are normally shy need a little bit of Dutch courage in order to talk to people of the opposite sex at a bar or a club. I'm sure you've heard that expression. Dutch courage is that little bit of alcohol that is needed to rid yourselves of inhibitions, to give you the courage to approach members of the opposite sex. Because alcohol makes you do things you wouldn't normally be able to do on your own. Paul says in Ephesians 5 verse 18, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, Paul notices the difference here, because while alcohol can make you do things you wouldn't normally do on your own, and it gives people the courage to do things that they wouldn't normally be able to do, there's a better way. Instead, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit also enables us to do things that we wouldn't normally be able to do on our own. And it is the Holy Spirit who gives people the courage to do things that they wouldn't normally be able to do. So in order to be able to tell our friends or our loved ones, even those we don't even know about Jesus, it takes courage that comes from the Holy Spirit. You see, we're not alone in this. Jesus said, I will be with you always. This thing takes an ability that we don't have, but the Spirit does have it. And when we're filled with the Spirit, we can do things that we can't normally do on our own. Because let's face it, if I was to down a bottle of vodka, I could walk down the streets of Coleraine telling people to be saved and I wouldn't have a care in the world. It wouldn't be a great witness because I'd be wasted, but I would have ample courage. But here's the thing, we don't need artificial courage. Paul says, instead, be filled with the Spirit and you will have the courage to do something like that. Now, I'm not saying we walk up and down the streets of Coleraine telling people to be saved. I'm not sure how effective that is, but the point is, Whatever it is we find hard to do when it comes to telling others about Jesus becomes less hard when we're filled with the Spirit. And that means we need to pray. Pray for this power in our lives. Pray as a church for the power to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to our neighbourhoods. And we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to fill us and give us the courage to do it. Now we're not going into what to say or how we say it. That will come in a few weeks' time. All I'm saying today is that some of us, maybe all of us, need the courage to do something. Back to my imaginary scene earlier. Who would you tell about this fire that was going to destroy North Antrim? Your friends? Your family? Anyone who'd listen? And the question that burned in me was this. Do I believe that saving the lives of men, women and children is more important than my own comfort? In fact, let me rephrase that. Do I believe that saving the lives of the people whom I love and care about is more important than my own comfort? See, that makes it slightly different because I have friends who aren't Christians, who are spiritually sick, who are spiritually dead. And I have been given the power and authority over sickness and death through the Holy Spirit. I have family who are not Christians, who are spiritually sick, who are spiritually dead. And I have been given the power and authority over sickness and death through the Holy Spirit. And so the question for me is, do I love my family and friends enough to tell them the good news that Jesus Christ loves them and will save them from fiery judgment if they put their trust in him? I mean, I say I love them, but do I really? Would I rather not just keep the peace and say nothing rather than bring this good news to them? Would I rather just keep my friendship and not annoy them and just let them be judged and not make a fuss? Do I really love them? Or do I really have the courage to do this? I'm not sure I do, but I want to. I want to have the courage to do this. And so I'm praying that I will be filled with the Spirit to enable me to do what I could never do on my own, to give me the authority over sickness and death and to speak words of life to my friends and family in the hope that miraculous things, extraordinary things happen in their lives. But when we realize that we have the power and authority of God himself, who is with us, 
wherever we go, then maybe, just maybe, that might give us the courage to step out and tell people, starting with the ones we love, that Jesus loves them. And we'll save them if they put their hope and trust in him and repent. Jesus takes the ordinary and he makes it extraordinary. He did it with the 12 disciples. He did it with the 72 others. And he can do it with you and me. And he gives us the courage to do it through his spirit. And he equips us to be able to do it through his spirit. And he will be with us as we do it through his spirit. We don't need Dutch courage to be able to do this. All we need is an infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives and a commitment to obey Jesus' call to go and be witnesses. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, come and fill us and enable us to do this. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. We need the courage to be able to go and tell our friends and family, even people who don't, we don't even know about Jesus. There are so many people who are spiritually sick and spiritually dead, and we have the power in us to raise them from the dead, to heal their sickness, because we have Jesus who can free them from their spiritual sickness and their spiritual death. But if we don't tell anyone, well, how can they be made whole? If they don't hear the word, the good news that Jesus loves them, how can they be made whole? How can they have their sins forgiven? How can they escape this fiery judgment? Oh, Jesus, we need your help. We need your, your courage that comes from you. So pour your spirit on us. Fill us with your spirit and help us to have the courage to go and tell others about you. This is our prayer and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.